Okay, so we'll get started now. Um, thank you very much. This is Sharon Hesterly. I'm the Vice President of Research for Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, and we're very happy to have with us for this uh, webinar series Thomas Meyer and Gunnar Weissey from Synthera Pharmaceuticals. They're going to tell us about the results of their Phase three study for Idevanone um, on respiratory outcomes in Duchenne. Um, just to answer a few questions up front, this, uh, you know, obviously you've heard the prompt. This um, presentation is being recorded. It will be available afterwards on our website. Um, so if you miss it or you have a friend who misses it, you can let them know that. Just so you know how we will proceed, if you've been on these conferences before, um, Thomas and Gunnar are going to speak for about 45 minutes to go through the data from the Phase three study. We've received some questions in advance, um, and you can also write in questions in the chat box um, that you can see on your screen. After the presentation, we will work through those questions. Um, I will ask the questions to, um, to Drs. Meyer and, and Bicey, and you will hear the answers there. If anything isn't answered, um, we will try to follow up and get those questions and post them later, so you don't need to worry about that. So with no further ado, I will go ahead and turn um, turn over the controls to uh, Thomas Meyer from Synthera Pharmaceuticals. Well, thank you, Sharon. Uh, this is Thomas Meyer, uh, Synthera Pharmaceuticals. I'm the company's chief scientific officer and CEO. Before we go on and I introduce you, our um, co-speaker, I would like to make the following statement. We are a public company and the audience should be aware of uh, the disclaimer that we're showing now with respect to uh, forward-looking statements that we may make during the presentation. Now, with this, I would like to introduce Professor Gunnar Boise, sitting next to me here on the desk. Uh, Professor Boise is uh, from the Child Neurology Department at the University Hospitals in Leuven, in Belgium, and he is a child neurologist by training and full professor of medicine. He is the principal investigator of the Phase two and Phase three studies that we conducted with him uh, with Idebenon in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, the purpose of today's webinar is really to inform the patient community about the outcome of the phase three trial, the DELOS trial, that was presented to the uh, expert panel, to the clinicians, and to the researchers at uh, Saturday's late-breaking conference at the World Muscle Society in Berlin. Uh, and this leads us to the agenda, so we will, and Professor Boise will lead through, uh, introduce the topic addressing the medical need in DMD with focus on respiratory illness, and then he will briefly summarize the rationale and the hypothesis of using idebenon in this disease, briefly summarizing the preceding preclinical data and the phase two trial, but the bulk of the presentation will be the data and the outcome the successful outcome of the phase three trial, uh, DELOS. And then in the end, a brief summary is followed by a Q&A session. And with this, I would like to hand over to Gunnar Boise. Gunnar. Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. It's nice talking to you, although seeing would be better. Um, I will start by very briefly introducing the medical need or the medical problem, which is the focus of uh, our development program, and that is the respiratory illness in DMD. Um, so the problem is that in DMD, it's not only the lymph muscles who get weak, but there is also um, weakness and progressive weakness of the muscles which are responsible for our respiration, and that creates important lung disease, um, which gets worse with increasing age. We know that steroids um, can delay the onset and the progression of this respiratory illness, um, but nevertheless, respiratory illness continues to be a, a major problem, a dominant cause of handicap and also early mortality, and this is also the case in steroid-treated patients, so there is definitely still a major problem to address. Um, so, how can we measure respiratory illness or respiratory function and its decline in DMD? Um, as I have mentioned, the, 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 the primary problem is that the muscles get weak and that this weakness of muscles will create or lead to uh, a restriction of lung volume, which is uh, called in medical terms restrictive lung disease. And so, um, for the weakness, one parameter that can um, 
measure this is peak expiratory flow (PEF), um, and you will hear a lot of this uh, in the in the in the talk. Um, a measure of the restriction in lung volume um, is a force visor capacity, and I'm sure that most people uh, will be familiar with uh, FVC. Um, the thing is that um, so uh, peak flow is a measure of strength or of weakness, uh, which is earlier involved and earlier abnormal in the disease course. FVC will be a measure of the restriction in lung volume uh, and of the restrictive lung disease, which is usually a little bit later in the disease involved. And as the disease progresses, there's other factors like scoliosis, for example, which can also have influence on FVC. So these two uh, parameters are important and, and tools to measure the respiratory function and its decline in uh, BMD. Important to know, um, so I've mentioned peak flow is uh, considered a more early marker of respiratory function or dysfunction in the disease. Uh, we know uh, since long now that the decline in the vital capacity is important and so that this correlates with uh, mortality and I'll come back to that uh, later in the slides. Um, so um, this slide shows what the evolution of respiratory function and of respiratory illness is in the course of uh, DMD and so um, what it shows is the force vital capacity expressed as percent predicted over time over age. So um, it's at the left, these are patients in the age group seven to nine years old. Here, seven to nine years old, and it goes up to adulthood. And so what you see in uh, red is the evolution of force vital capacity over time with increasing age, and you see that it's declining and getting, going downhill to uh, a stage where there is um, respiratory failure and being dependent on artificial ventilation. Uh, I told you what we know is that when you uh, give steroids that you can delay uh, the progression of the, the decline and that is shown in blue. So the uh, blue uh, line is patients which are on steroids and you see that the decline is uh, delayed and is uh, going down slower than in patients not being treated with uh, steroids. Now there's a few uh, issues about steroids that uh, should be kept in mind. Uh, one is that there is a small uh, proportion, it's a minority, it's a small proportion that does not uh, uh, seem to respond to steroids. The second thing is that there is patients um, who do not do, uh, who cannot do chronic treatment because they have major side effects. And the third thing that is that even the treatment effect of steroids, uh, whether it's imp it is important, but it's still uh, only a partial effect, so there's a partial protection. And as you can see in the slide here, also the patients uh, in the blue line, so the patient on steroids, they also decline and they also evolve into respiratory failure. Um, and in fact, in the population uh, from this paper, um, if you look at patients above the age of 10, then about 40% of patients were not using steroids. So this illustrates that respiratory illness is still uh, or continues to be a major problem uh, in the disease. So there is a high unmet medical need and there's something to do about this. Um, so coming to uh, the approach with idebenone, um, very briefly, idebenone, what is important to know is that it has two modes of action. On the one hand, it will be an antioxidant, so it reduces oxidative stress. On the other hand, it also increases the energy production in, in the cells. And so you might ask, so what has, why is this important or could this be important for DMD? This brings us to the disease mechanisms which we know uh, um, in, in DMD. So the, the, the problem is, you all know that the lack of dystrophin is the primary problem in, in DMD. Um, what happens is that there is a, a whole cascade of um, downstream events which will make the cells die. And one of these is that uh, one um, compartment in the cells, which are called mitochondria, that they are uh, becoming dysfunctional, so they do not work properly. And there's two aspects there. One, on the one hand, is that there will be a reduced generation of energy in the cell. And the other the, uh, aspect is that there will be oxidative stress. And so the interesting thing is that idebenone can target both of these aspects. And that is the scientific 
rationale that led to the uh, hypothesis and to the investigations. So um, what have we done to investigate this uh, hypothesis? The first thing is um, that we started in an animal model, um, the NDX mouse, which is a well-established animal model for the disease. And so um, what we were able to show, um, and the data are published, um, that is that in these mice there was a clear and a very strong protection of the heart uh, with idebenone treatment uh, compared to placebo treatment. And on the other hand, that the voluntary running or exercise performance of these mice, which were treated with idebenone, was significantly better and, and normalized compared with mice that were treated with um, placebo. So these uh, animal data, they were the basis um, to go into humans. And the first step when going into humans is by doing a smaller proof of concept study, which is a phase two study and known and at the Delphi trial, and also these data are uh, published extensively. Um, what we found in the Delphi uh, study is that, uh, and that is shown here in this uh, little graph, is that uh, when looking at peak expiratory flow, so that's one of the uh, respiratory function measures that I talked about earlier, that um, when you see in the placebo group there was a strong decline in this parameter, and when, you, when we looked at the idebenone group, then there was a stabilization or even an improvement in this uh, parameter, in this peak expiratory flow. Uh, importantly, and, and of notice, is that um, in this trial there were both patients on steroids and patients not on steroids, and so when we looked at these different populations, then it became clear uh, that the treatment effect of idebenone was uh, significantly larger in patients not using uh, steroids. And so all of these aspects were integrated into the planning of a uh, large um, phase three trial. And that brings me to um, the uh, DELOS um, trial, which is the um, uh, first successful phase three trial in DMD. Um, the primary objective of this study was to um, uh, find again and hopefully confirm the efficacy of, of idebenone in delaying the loss of respiratory function in the MD patients. And to do so, we used a gold standard phase three randomized controlled trial. This trial was multi-center because of its magnitude um, and international with centers participating both in Europe and in the US. Um, very briefly, um, which patients um, did um, uh, participate. Uh, in total, 64 patients were randomized and treated. They were between the age of 10 and 18 years old. There was no selection for mutational st status, uh, and patients had to be off chronic steroids for at least one year. Um, because of the older age, 92% um, of patients were wheelchair-bound. And as far as the treatment, so it, they received either placebo or idebenone, 900 milligrams per day. The mean age was 14 years, uh, and so treatment duration was 12 months. Um, this is um, a list of all the participating centers, and as you can see, there were uh, many centers in Europe and in the U.S., and uh, well, I have no time to go into the details or to list or to, to mention them all, but I want to take the opportunity to thank all people, all participating centers uh, who have uh, contributed and collaborated. I think we all together did a great effort. Um, as far as the design, um, so it's a 12-month study um, with efficacy evaluations every three months, so at week 13, 26, 39, and week 52. Um, there were additional safety assessments, and so the treatment was either idebenone, 900 milligrams a day, so that's two tablets three times a day, or matching uh, placebo. This slide shows you the characteristics at baseline for the two groups, so the idebenone group here, and then the placebo group. Um, but uh, in, in general, the two populations were well uh, balanced for all the different uh, uh, characteristics listed here. Um, there were 33 patients in the idebenone group. There were 33 uh, patients uh, in the placebo group. Um, there was a slight um, difference in age. Um, so the idebenone group, the mean age was there 13.5 years. 
in the placebo group, the mean age was 15 uh, years. Because these are older patients, and I've mentioned it before, 90% uh, or more in the two groups were wheelchair-bound patients. And so it also importantly for the primary endpoint, which is peak expiratory flow, the um, patients were stratified to make sure that, um, that the, the severity of abnormality for the peak flow would be uh, equal or similar in the two treatment uh, groups. So how did we um, measure respiratory function in the trial? Um, we did this by using two different uh, instruments or devices. The first one was a spirometer. This is a device that you may know from visiting uh, your uh, physician in the hospital or at the clinics. Um, uh, this device was used to um, assess respiratory function at the hospital visits only, so at months 3, 6, 9, and 12, and at baseline, of course. The other uh, instrument we used is a portable device. It's a small device called Asthma One, and the interesting thing about this is that it allowed us to ask patients to measure their lung function every week at home, which gives us many more data than just only every three months one assessment in the hospital uh, setting. Um, we now uh, will show the outcome for all uh, treated patients, and first uh, we will start, of course, with the primary endpoint, which is peak expiratory flow. And this slide, you see it uh, expressed as percent predicted um, you will see this type of graph many more times, and so we'll spend a little bit more time the first time you see it now uh, um, to, to make sure that everyone uh, um, uh, can follow it uh, as it should. So what this graph shows is peak expiratory flow percent predicted here, and it shows the change from baseline here to the end of the trial, so at 52 weeks. Um, and so the measurements at hospital visits, so 13 weeks, 26 weeks, 39 weeks, and 52 weeks. Uh, in gray, you see the patients on placebo. In orange, you see the patients on idebenone. And um, it is not difficult to see that there is a, a remarkable difference between the two groups in how they evolve um, after baseline. So what you see in the placebo group is that there is uh, almost m minus 9 uh, percent predicted over these 52 weeks of treatment with placebo, and that's a very significant and strong worsening um, in peak expiratory flow. If you then see in orange, to, and you look at the idebenone group, then you see that this decline is only minus 2.57. That's a non-significant change. And so that leads to a 71 percent reduction in the loss of this uh, parameter over the uh, duration of the trial, which is very significant. Here, the table at the bottom shows you at the different time points, so at 30 weeks, 26 weeks, 39 weeks, and 52 weeks, the differences between the two treatment groups, so between placebo and idebenone. And so here you can see that starting from week 26, 39, and 52, that is a statistically significant difference between the two treatment groups. So I think this clearly shows that for the primary endpoint that uh, this was met um, in the trial. We um, have analyzed, obviously, and I will show you the uh, first peak flow and then other respiratory function parameters in the same way. But in, in this slide, what you see here is the same parameters, so peak expiratory flow. This time, not expressed in percent predicted, but in absolute values, like you measure it. So that is, I, uh, this is a flow measurement, so it's liters air per minute that you can exhale after in, uh, in, in inspiration. And so here uh, you see for the idebenone group in orange and then the placebo group in gray what happens during from baseline to week 52. And again, here you see the same uh, difference. So there is a, a significant worsening in the um, placebo group, whereas there's a stabilization or even an improvement in the um, uh, idebenone uh, group. Um, I have mentioned it that uh, we also used um, a, a portable device that allowed us to measure, to do weekly measurements of peak flow um, in the home situation. And this shows you the results for peak expiratory flow in percent predicted, but this time measured with this Asthma One device. Um, it basically shows, so the graph is the same as before. You see change from baseline to week 52. 
for placebo in gray, for idebenone in orange. And so you see again the same pattern, so a very strong and significant worsening in the placebo group and a stabilization or a very small decline, which is non-significant in the idebenone group, giving uh, or leading to an 80% reduction in the loss of uh, this parameter with idebenone. Uh, one other um, uh, respiratory function parameter that I mentioned is forced vital capacity, so which tells you about lung volume, uh, to simplify it. Um, and so this graph shows you what happens with forced vital capacity expressed as a percent predicted. Again, the change from baseline to the end of uh, the trial of treatment, so 52 weeks. And, well, you see the same pattern uh, than um, before. Um, with um, placebo, there is a about 9% predicted decline over the 52 weeks. The decline is uh, also there um, in the um, idebenone treatment group, but a statistically significant um, uh, smaller decline with uh, idebenone, and the difference between the, the two groups is a 37% reduction in the loss of uh, foresight capacity in percent predicted. Um, the same parameters of force vital capacity, but this time um, in liters, so not in percent predicted. Um, and you see here, so again for the two treatment groups, in gray for placebo, in orange for idebenone, and you see the decline in the placebo group, um, and then in the idebenone treatment group, a stabilization, and at all time points, 13, 26, 39, and 52 weeks, the difference between the two treatment groups is statistically significant. Um, the last uh, parameter or third parameter for respiratory function is FEV1. Uh, it's uh, like uh, force vital capacity, also a lung volume, but it's the lung volume that you can blow out in one second. Um, and it's also um, a parameter used in, in DMD uh, respiratory illness. Um, it shows, again, the same graph, so change from baseline to end of treatment at 52 weeks. Again, here for uh, placebo, minus 10, almost minus 11 in percent predicted decline or worsening for this parameter. For um, idebenone, minus 2.40, uh, small decline which, or stabilization, which is non-significant change from baseline. And so the difference between the two groups is a 78% reduction in the loss of this parameter over time. And again, at all time points, so 13, 26, 39, and 52 weeks, the difference between the two treatment groups is statistically significant. Um, this shows you, um, again, FEV1, but this time in liters, so not percent predicted, but in absolute values. You measure this in liters of air that you can blow out. And again, here, the same uh, pattern, uh, a decline in, um, with placebo and stabilization or a small increase or improvement with idebenone with a statistically significant difference between the two treatment uh, groups at all time points. We also looked at the other respiratory um, parameters, um, MIP, MEP, and peak cough flow, and they are listed in this table here. Um, for these parameters, we did not uh, see a statistically significant b difference between the two uh, treatment groups. And you should explain what MIP and MEP is. But MIP, uh, yes. So uh, MEP is uh, maximal expiratory pressure, and MIP is uh, maximal inspiratory pressure. So these are mouth pressures uh, during expiration or in inspiration, and PCF is peak cough flow. Yeah, and, well, but I, I don't think we have the time to go into the discussion here, but so what is um, obvious if people look at the details, that is that the, the amount, the degree of abnormality for these parameters is, is uh, a lot uh, uh, worse than uh, what we see with um, peak expiratory flow and with F, uh, force vital capacity. Um, we also looked um, um, at uh, other parameters and, and that this was pre-specified and one thing uh, we were interested is to see uh, the amount of responders and responders were defined um, as patients who during the duration of the trial did not worsen in certain parameters. And, and here are listed all the respiratory function parameters, so peak flow, force vital capacity in FEV1, either uh, in 
10 predicted or in absolute values. And so what the table shows is that for all these parameters, there were many more responders in the idebenone group than in the placebo group. So many more patients in the placebo group would worsen in contrast to the um, uh, idebenone group. We um, also wanted to assess whether or not uh, patients who had previously been on steroids uh, behaved differently or not from those patients who never had used steroids. So remember, in the DELOS trial, patients were off steroids during the trial, but before the study, in the past, some patients would have been on steroids and others would never have been on steroids. And so we just wanted to make sure or um, investigate whether this uh, would have a difference on the treatment effects observed with idebenone. And so, um, in fact, there was uh, no differences. So we saw exactly the same outcome, and this is shown in these graphs. Um, so on the left, patients who had been on previous uh, steroids, and on the right here, patients were completely steroid naive. And so the treatment effect um, of idebenone was similar and for all patients 6.27 whether you were uh, in the past on steroids or not, it was exactly the same treatment effect size. So there was no difference of this um, uh, previous use of steroids or not. Um, another aspect we wanted to assess is whether the therapeutic effect uh, from idebenone uh, was different in older versus in younger patients. Remember that there was this very slight age imbalance between the two groups. So we have analyzed um, patients, we did subgroup analysis, and so we looked at patients younger than 14 years, which is the median um, age um, of, the, of the cohort, or older at 14 years, and here you see it for peak extracellular flow, uh, flow force fighter capacity, and FEV1. Um, and we found that um, patients, both patient groups benefit from, uh, the, from idebenone, so both um, uh, the above 14 years old, but also the uh, patients below the age of 14. And in fact, in the data indicate that the treatment effect of idebenone was in fact slightly larger in the younger patient population. So this might indicate that patients may benefit more if treatment would be started earlier. Um, now, um, what this or what could this mean for patients? Um, we looked at, uh, at uh, certain threshold values for FEC, force fighter capacity, and also for peak cough flow because it is known from the literature, for example, for force fighter capacity, that one liter threshold is important in a way that it is predictive. So once you fall below the threshold, that this is predictive for bad outcome. And so um, what we found is, is that there were many less patients on idebenone. In fact, only one patient during the trial on idebenone fell below this one liter threshold, whereas in the placebo group there were five patients falling below this uh, threshold. The same, um, but then for peak cough flow, so there it's known that uh, 160 liters per minute, per minute is an important um, threshold, uh, predictive of outcome. And so the same story here, if you look at idebenone, there was only one patient falling below this threshold during the study, whereas in the placebo group there were six patients falling below these thresholds. Um, another observation came from the um, um, occurrence of respiratory tract-related adverse events um, during the study. Um, so this table lists respiratory tract infections as adverse events during the study for the idebenone group and for the placebo group. And what it shows is that there were uh, fewer patients in the idebenone group 14 patients versus 23 patients in the placebo group who uh, experienced respiratory tract infections during uh, the study. This is um, complicated, maybe, but this is a so-called Kaplan-Meier analysis, and what it shows you is that patients who were on, on idebenone, shown in, uh, in orange, that they had a, a, a lower risk of um, catching up respiratory tract infections during the study than patients being on placebo. So this is percentage of patients without uh, upper airway infections over the duration of the study, and so there were many more in the um, uh, placebo cohort. Um, so um, we have shown uh, so far efficacy data um, 
measured with hospital-based um, measurements, measured also at home with the Atma-1 device and supported by um, supportive um, clinical observations. But um, how about tolerance and safety? Because that was the other aspect that needed investigation in this uh, phase three trial. So this slide shows you serious adverse events. There were no deaths during the study. Uh, and um, in fact, there were many more serious adverse events in the placebo group than there were in the idebenone group. This uh, shows you the general adverse events. Um, and so what is uh, here? So the, the, the occurrence of adverse events was comparable in both groups, uh, so equal in idebenone and placebo. The most common adverse events were nasopharyngitis and headache, and they were comparable uh, or equally distributed in the two cohorts. Um, diarrhea um, occurred um, more in the, um, in the idebenone group. The diarrhea was always mild and transient, and in fact, this is a known side effect of idebenone uh, to some extent dependent on the diet of uh, the patients. Um, so from these last two slides, we can c conclude that idebenone treatment um, was safe and uh, well tolerated. So this um, brings me to uh, summarizing and, and wrapping up. Uh, this is the first completed and the only positive phase three trial in DMD. The data um, show a statistically significant and, and clinically relevant outcomes of primary and secondary endpoints. Uh, they demonstrate that idebenone reduced the loss of respiratory function in 10 to 18-year-old DMD patients not using concomitant steroids, and treatment was safe and well tolerated. And with this, I would like to end and uh, i especially like to thank the, uh, the DMD children and their families for participating in both the phase two and three trials, uh, and PPMD for inviting us to this uh, webinar. Thank you. So going back to the moderator, Sharon. Yes, so thank you very much. Thank you both for presenting this um, really uh, interesting data. So as we start the question se section of the webinar, I just want to mention that um, Santera would very kindly answered a lot of questions in writing in advance of, of this webinar, and that that uh, information is posted on our website. And I'm going to ask Danielle to post a link so that you can see those questions. And there were a lot of questions along the lines of what is the difference between CoQ10 and Idebina. And there's both a very easy-to-understand version and a more technical version. So you can see some of those basic questions there. So we don't want to cover too much ground that's already been covered. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that it's not really appropriate for um, Thomas and Gunnar to answer questions about specific situations. So if you have a question that's very specific about your particular child and his medical situation, that should be answered by your primary physician, so they won't be able to answer those specific questions. So with that being said, um, I'll start off by saying I think um, we've definitely gotten <clears throat> several questions from people who want to better understand if the drug is likely to help boys with very acute respiratory, um, or not acute, but, but severe respiratory failure. Um, in your group that, you know, that you study, um, do you have any reason to think that for boys who are very um, severely affected by the disease that this would be useful? Well, um, what the study involved patients that had less than 80% predicted on, on the PEF, uh, peak expiratory flow, and a subgroup of the patients actually had uh, peak expiratory flow at baseline below 40%. Um, now, I don't exactly know um, what type of severity you're talking about. I think um, the idea was of the study to enroll patients who, have on the, who are on the steepest decline of their initial phase of their respiratory function decline in order to uh, determine the difference between placebo and, and active. I, I don't think that we are in a position here to answer that general question. I think that should be referred to a treating physician, but Gunnar maybe have a, a point here. Well, what, what we should um, um, say is that in, the, in an exclusion criteria, um, patients who were uh, supposed to be initiated on artificial ventilation because they were so severely ill uh, in their lungs that they were not able to be enrolled for several good reasons. So this makes that we cannot, with the data of this trial, cannot give an answer on, on that question. The other thing is that, well, 
looking at we, in the superb analysis we did um, above and below the age of 14 and we saw similar e treatment effects but um, we have no data what would could be expected in patients who are on the edge of being on a ventilator or who are already on a ventilator we have not been able to investigate this that in this uh, phase 3 trial okay thank you i suspect although it wasn't stated that that was kind of what people were getting at could you avoid a ventilator or improve function on a ventilator? And it sounds like that data just isn't available yet. Um, we have no data, no data from patients on ventilators. So another question that's, you know, an obvious question, people are very interested in the fact that um, it's likely that the label may be for boys who are not on prednisone for the reasons that, you know, you've explained. Um, and the data that you showed showed that the biggest difference you saw in the effect was in the boys who were not on steroids. But you did see a very small uh, increase in boys who are steroids. So people are wondering how this drug might be used with steroids. I think um, probably people who are seeing good effects with steroids would be not inclined to take their children off steroids to get this drug. So how do you see no, the... No, no. Uh, okay. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, uh, we are not recommending to take patients off steroids who are benefiting from steroid use. Uh, there's a priori no reason to believe that there might be any drug-drug interaction or so that could preclude the efficacy of steroids or adebinone when they're given in combination. In fact, we have a very small data set from the Phase two trial that um, in, indicated that there's a benefit but it could be very small, and it's certainly challenging to really demonstrate this to the extent that the regulators would be satisfied with, with that. So I think it's a bit too early to really come to that conclusion. We need to discuss that with, with the regulators. The, the data set we have is primarily on patients not using steroids, and this is what we primarily focus to position the drug in uh, as a treatment. But obviously that's an interesting question, but we would need additional data to come to a, a statement on the use of, on, on the use of adebinone in combination with steroids. We don't have enough data right now. Right. And that, so, of course, this follow-on question there is, do you have plans to study them together to get that additional data? Uh, well, we have not decided what the what, what plans forward are. I think as a next step, uh, we would like to discuss um, the regulatory path with the FDA and with the European regulators at some point in time. And this will be also a discussion point what uh, regulators would recommend to us what could be possible additional studies to support the label. Uh, it is, at this point in time, we have not made a clear decision what additional studies would look like. Okay. Um, also, you know, we have a few questions about what um, Idevanon might be doing in other systems like cardiac or skeletal muscle. Do you have any thoughts about, I know these weren't the main outcomes in your study, do you have any plans to look at effects? Um, well, we, um, uh, okay, so cardiac outcomes have been investigated in the phase two Delphi trial and the data are published. Uh, we used a very sensitive measurement uh, to investigate the effect on the contractility of the heart, which is called the strain rate measurements, and there we saw a signal that uh, indicated that it might be beneficial, but we have not enough data really to come to conclusions whether it could be beneficial for the heart function, for the global heart function. So that is something that we may consider also looking into heart function in the future. And with uh, respect to muscle strength, uh, as you have seen, the patients that we enrolled were very older, uh, certainly older than, than other trials that have been run in the recent past, and they were all, most of them were wheelchair bound and very weak, and I think Gunnar can speak to that. So we haven't seen any signal on uh, maintenance or improvement of muscle strength, upper limb muscle strength, but I think we would not have expected that due to the fact that these patients are already older and much more severely affected. So we have really only data on the respiratory function for the time being. Okay. Um, you know, another... Okay, so an, another qu question is um, the idea of using idevanone in combination with some other therapies like exon skipping. Do you think there's any reason that um, they couldn't be used that way, or would you expect that we will see combination treatment? 
Well, I'm definitely a believer. Maybe believer is the wrong word, but um, I, I, there is no reason to think that the, the combination therapy would not be useful. Um, so far, there is not a single uh, approach that would be curative and would cure and, and, and solve the, the problem entirely. Uh, even with exon skipping, there is a remaining uh, abnormal situation. So the answer is yes. It definitely could be reasonable to expect that combination therapy would be uh, valuable, but uh, this is obviously not being uh, investigated. Could you, um, and I don't know how much you're willing to speculate, but if you were willing to talk a little bit about what the timeline is going forward to an approval. Um, yeah, that, yeah, I'm sure I understand that this is an urgent question, but it's for us really too early to come up with any timelines. We, we have initiated discussions with the regulators, and we will update the public maybe in a webinar at a later point in time when we have more clarity on, on timelines and approval path. It is, was not the purpose of today's presentation, and we, we, we're not in a position to indicate any timelines at this moment. Okay. I mean, it's probably worth stating that this is actually the first uh, clinical trial in Shin for phase three that has met its endpoint, its primary endpoint. So um, I think people are eagerly awaiting next steps. Um, but I understand that it's hard to predict. Um, so, you know, a few other questions that have come in during the um, – during the discussion, is someone noted that, in particular, the, it looks like there's a drop in the placebo group between week 13 and 26 that's pretty precipitous, and then it slows down. And this person wondered if there was any explanation for why the placebo group takes such a, a steep dive. Well, we don't have a good explanation. It's also, um, if you look at multiple analyses uh, with, with the um, – home-based device, we, we have not necessarily seen in all these analyses the same drop within the first 26 weeks. So there are some analyses which is much more linear decline. Some analyses, as, as we have shown, they show this significant drop. Uh, I believe of, from what I've seen so far is that the data or the change over time is much more smooth if you look at the raw data, the non-normalized data. Uh, but but uh, there's no mechanistic ex explanation. Um, no, we have no further explanation of, of, of this uh, phenomenon. Maybe go on. Well, and the other thing is that if you look over the year, so over the 52 weeks, that so that the amount of, uh, de uh, of decrease is um, in line with what you would expect from natural history data. So um, it could be that maybe it's more between week 13 and 26, and then a little bit less, but if you look over the entire 52 weeks, so one year, then the decrease is uh, similar to what is known from uh, natural history, history data. And so in clinic, we not always measure every three months or every 13 weeks the patients for their re respiratory function, so it could be that there's some variability there. Okay. Um, another question is about trials in other countries, um, India in specific. Specifically, um, do you have any plans to look at trials or approvals in India in the future, where there's quite a large population of boys with Duchenne? Yeah, it's, it's, again, it's um, as I said, we now have to sort out our plans going forward, and uh, in, in various countries, uh, and I'm aware of that um, because we have now pro been approached by a number of patients already uh, from India. So I think we take this on board as a as a uh, clear signal that there's a need in India where, where we need to investigate what could be done. We have no concrete plans at this point, but it takes this on board as a, as a suggestion to, to think about it. Okay. And then one final question, um, and we can probably wrap up um, unless there are any, any more, if anyone wants to write in another question. But can you talk about the rationale for the dose that was chosen uh, for the study? Uh, yeah, well, I, I thought maybe going to add. I mean, we we had a uh, at, at the phase two trial, the Delphi trial, we used a, a lower dose, and this was all based driven by the available safety information we had at the time. And then we we learned while the phase two trial was ongoing and finished that about the outcome of our phase one trials we did in healthy volunteers, and and had more information about um, plasma levels correlated to dose. So at the start of the phase three trial. Uh, we had enough safety data uh, in going up to 900 milligram a day, and uh, we also followed some guidance that we were receiving from regulators in, before we initiated the trial. So um, the question may then lead whether higher doses 
could add more benefit, and we don't know that. We have no efficacy data at higher doses. We do have, and this is published in other indications like pre-drexotaxia, we have those children at higher doses and we have the safety information, but we have no additional efficacy data that, that we can um, use in order to justify using higher doses for the time being. Okay, and then actually one question that's just come in is, um, can boys take adevanone and CoQ10 together? Well, Guna, maybe the clinic. I can't, well, I can't give my comment. I, I think there's, I don't think there's a reason not to take it. I'm, I'm very personally skeptical about the usefulness of CoQ10, and the reason simply is that this is not water soluble. It has different pharmacological properties than Adepinon has. I mean, I don't know what, what the medical practice is, uh, practices here. But Idebanon is not CoQ10. They have different characteristics, and there is not a single evidence, not single data that would justify the use of CoQ10 in the MD. So, for me, there is no indication for using CoQ10 in the MD. Okay, so there's no reason to use it, but it, do you, would you think there would be a safety problem with using it together if someone? Mm. But regardless of safety, I mean, there is not a single reason or uh, justification to use it. No one, no one has ever shown that CoQ10 could be or would be beneficial in the MD. Right. So if you take that as a criteria, then I don't think we should prescribe it. Yeah. Right. We don't, we don't believe that there's a, there could be a safety problem. I, I, I have no evidence. Again, we have excluded the use of CoQ10 in our studies, but from the, I, I, I can't imagine that there's a safety risk. But as I said, Gunnar said, there may be no reason to take it from an efficacy point of view. Right. Okay, and if you want more information about the difference between adebinone and CoQ10, again, that, that's all outlined in this document that's posted actually with the information about the webinar. Um, and maybe we can um, post that again on the chat box. But unless anyone has a final question or feel like your question wasn't answered, if you do, you're welcome to email me. Um, yeah, okay, there's, that's the link that's posted for the FAQ, the written information. Um, you can email me <clears throat> afterwards at Sharon at parentprojectmd.org. We'll try and get your, your questions answered. And um, otherwise, we will have a recording posted and a, a presentation that you can review later. So with that, I want to thank very much Thomas Meyer and uh, Dana Ricey for giving their time and presenting this um, really interesting positive phase three data. Well, thank you very much. Our pleasure. All right. Thank you.